Thank you for taking time out of your day to attend this annual influenza season kickoff webinar. My name is Shannon McBee, and I'm an epidemiologist and the influenza coordinator with the Division of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the Bureau for Public Health. The influenza season officially kicks off Sunday, October 2nd. This webinar is intended for local health departments, sentinel providers, hospitals, and other flu partners. The objectives of today's webinar is to describe the components of influenza surveillance and to describe the importance of the surveillance program. We will also summarize the 2015-2016 flu season, review the roles and responsibilities of local health departments for the upcoming flu season, describe the roles and responsibilities of influenza sentinel providers and hospitals, we will discuss key aspects of investigating influenza outbreaks. We will review the 2016-2017 influenza vaccine recommendations and review testing for respiratory pathogens. I will start off today by describing the influenza surveillance program here in the United States. There are five major types of influenza surveillance. The data I'm about to show you can be accessed through our website. We have a link to the flu view from the CDC website. This first graph on slide four is of virologic surveillance for the 2015-2016 flu season. Virologic surveillance is laboratory testing surveillance using confirmatory testing methods by PCR or culture. Virologic surveillance comes from laboratories represented from the World Health Organization Collaborating Laboratories and the National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Surveillance System, who report the number of respiratory specimens tested and the number of positive for influenza types. A subset of these specimens are sent to CDC for antiviral and antigenic characterization. The virologic surveillance also includes surveillance for novel influenza strains. A human infection with novel influenza A is a nationally notifiable condition. Novel influenza A viruses are human infections with influenza A viruses that are different from currently circulating human seasonal influenza H1 and H3 viruses. The graph on slide 5 shows virologic surveillance across the U.S. showing influenza positive tests reported by CDC and by public health laboratories. The predominant strain last year was the influenza A H1N1 PDM09, or more commonly known as the 2009 pandemic strain. The second type of influenza surveillance is outpatient illness surveillance. This is where the sentinel provider partners come into picture. Each week, enrolled providers report the number of patients seen with influenza-like illness by age group and the total number of patients seen. This information on patient visits for influenza-like illness is collected through the CDC U.S. Outpatient Influenza-like Illness Surveillance Network, or ILINet. You can see from this graph on slide 6, this past flu season, shown in the red line with the triangles was a mild season which peaked late in March, similar to the 2011 and 2012 season. The third type of influenza surveillance in the United States is mortality surveillance. This system is done through two different systems. Mortality surveillance is rapid tracking of influenza-associated deaths. This includes influenza-associated deaths in persons less than 18 years of age, which is a nationally notifiable condition. Any laboratory-confirmed influenza-associated death in a child is reported through the system to CDC. During the past flu season, 
85 pediatric deaths were reported. This is one of the lowest number of reported pediatric deaths in years, likely due to the majority of the pediatric population being previously vaccinated against the influenza A H1N1. The second mortality surveillance system is from the National Center for Health Statistics. This system replaced the previous 122 U.S. City surveillance system. This data shows the total number of death certificates processed and the number for which pneumonia or influenza was listed as the underlying or contributing cause of death. The epidemic threshold is a point where the proportion of deaths attributed to pneumonia or influenza is significantly higher than what would be expected at that time of year in the absence of substantial influenza-related mortality. You often hear on the news that we are having an influenza epidemic. This is something that happens every season. Only during really mild seasons do we not go above that epidemic threshold. You can see that this past season was very mild and we barely went over the epidemic threshold from 2015 to 2016. Another way we measure the burden of influenza is through hospitalization surveillance. This system tracks influenza-associated hospitalizations in children and adults. The figure on slide 9 is a comparison between the 2015-2016 flu season and the 2014-2015 flu season. The graph on the left is the 2015-2016 flu season. You can see with just a quick glance what a mild season it was. This surveillance system also allows you to look at the burden of disease by age group. During the 2014-2015 flu season, the elderly was dis disproportionately affected as seen on the graph on the right-hand slide with the green line. Lastly, states report weekly to CDC the geographic spread of influenza in their state. Each week, the influenza coordinator uses statewide data to report West Virginia's activity as no activity, sporadic, local, regional, or widespread. This measures the geographic spread, but not the severity of influenza. Together, these five categories of influenza surveillance are designed to provide a national picture of influenza activity. Nationally, the 2015-2016 flu season was characterized as a moderate season. Activity across the United States was lower and peaked later compared to the previous three flu seasons. Activity was low through December and began to increase in January and peaked in mid-March. During the most recent 18 flu seasons, only two other seasons have peaked in March. Overall, across the U.S., there was lower percentages of outpatient visits for flu-like symptoms, lower hospitalization rates, and deaths were reported far fewer. Influenza A, H1N1, PDMO9 viruses predominated overall, but influenza A, H3N2 viruses were more commonly identified from October to early December, and influenza B viruses were more commonly identified from mid-April through mid-May. The majority of viruses characterized this season were antigenically similar to the vaccine virus. Illness overall was mild, coupled with a good vaccine match, made for a fairly painless flu season.
West Virginia also has a surveillance system in place for influenza. Slide 13 is of virologic surveillance in West Virginia. West Virginia collects virologic surveillance similar to what CDC does, only on a statewide basis. We have two different sources of data for virologic surveillance. This graph shows the number of positive tests for influenza by type and subtype as re reported by West Virginia hospitals and referral laboratories by PCR and culture only. Rapid tests are not included in the totals because of the low positive predictive values during times of low activity. This data is useful for assessing changes in influenza activity and type of circulating viruses. The left-hand y-axis gives us the total number of specimens isolated by these laboratories. West Virginia saw similar virologic trends to what the national data showed. Activity was relatively mild. We peaked in the middle of March, and activity slowly decreased through the end of May. The second type of virologic data is through the West Virginia Office of Laboratory Services, or OLS. OLS is a U.S. World Health Organization collaborating laboratory. They report the number of respiratory specimens tested and the number of positive for influenza types A and B each week. OLS provides more specific data on the subtypes of influenza circulating across West Virginia. OLS subtypes all influenza A and B viruses submitted. This virologic surveillance also allows us to conduct surveillance for novel influenza. This data is a collection of specimens submitted from sentinel providers, hospitals, and of outbreaks reported across the state. A subset of influenza viruses that OLS collects are sent to the CDC for further characterization, antiviral testing, and antigenic characterization. Influenza A, H1N1, PDM09, was the predominant strain seen for the 2015-2016 flu season in West Virginia. The next surveillance system we utilize is outpatient surveillance. Outpatient surveillance is done through our Sentinel Provider Program. Each county is required to have a provider within their county that reports electronically to an online portal the total number of patients seen weekly and the total number of patients seen weekly with influenza-like illness by age group. West Virginia had 62 participating providers for the 2015-2016 flu season. Information on patient visits from these healthcare providers is reported through the CDC U.S. Outpatient Influenza-like Illness Surveillance Network, or the ILINet. This activity may indicate that not many individuals sought care for flu-like symptoms or that illness was relatively mild, which prevented folks from not seeking care. West Virginia also utilizes syndromic surveillance. Syndromic surveillance uses information on emergency department visits and hospitalizations from hospitals across West Virginia to track health-related data for public health use. The platform West Virginia uses is called Biosense, in which enrolled hospitals report chief complaints and final diagnosis visits for influenza-like illness as a proportion of total patients seen. Syndromic surveillance allows us to determine the start, the peak, and the end of flu season. On slide 17, we can look at this data 
through a different view. This is a graph of syndromic surveillance for the past several flu seasons in West Virginia. This provides us a good temporal trend of flu across the state. The 2015-2016 flu season is seen in the blue line. You can see how late the season started and when it peaked. This temporal trend also allows us to see the severity of the season. Last season was very mild in comparison with the two previous flu seasons, with a smaller percentage of individuals seeking care for flu-like symptoms. Next, we will look at influenza outbreaks. Suspected outbreaks or clusters are a Category 1 disease in West Virginia and should be immediately reported to your local health department. The state has an outbreak team that investigates influenza outbreaks routinely seen in schools, long-term care facilities, or other closed settings. The 2015-2016 flu season was a mild season for flu outbreaks. 38 influenza outbreaks were reported this past season, compared to 86 during the 2014-2015 flu season which was characterized as moderately severe. Roughly half of all the influenza outbreaks reported last season were from long-term care facilities, followed by schools and child care facilities. Testing was done at 100% of the reported outbreaks, which shows the hard work done by local health department nurses and school staff. Over 75% of reported flu outbreaks relied on a positive rapid flu test for laboratory confirmation. Rapid tests can be useful during peak activity levels when we know that influenza is circulating in a community. However, during periods of low activity, such as the beginning of the season, they are not sensitive and should not be used without a confirmatory test such as PCR or culture. Outbreak reports are required to be submitted by local health departments within 30 days of closing the outbreak. Information in these reports capture important information which can be fed back to facilities to improve the management and control of flu outbreaks in long-term care facilities. Influenza can be introduced in lo into long-term care facilities by newly admitted residents, healthcare workers, and by visitors. Residents of long-term care facilities can experience severe and fatal illness during flu outbreaks. Preventing transmission of influenza in long-term care facilities requires a multifaceted approach, including vaccination, testing, infection control, antiviral treatment, and antiviral prophylaxis. 67% of influenza outbreaks in long-term care facilities reported having standing orders for vaccinations for the residents prior to the beginning of the flu season and 85% reported encouraging their healthcare workers to obtain their seasonal flu vaccine. Implementation of control measures in long-term care facilities can help slow and stop the spread of transmission of flu. 83% of the facilities reported limiting group activities during a flu outbreak. 75% reported administering antivirals to residents during influenza outbreaks and 67% reported implementing droplet precautions to their residents. Clinical presentation of influenza outbreaks in long-term care facilities can be somewhat complex. Many residents have underlying health conditions and may not present with your typical flu-like illness, which is a fever greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 
and a cough, and or sore throat. The following chart is a bar graph of the clinical presentation seen in long-term care facility outbreaks reported this past season. Because clinical presentation of influenza can be difficult to distinguish in the elderly, we encourage facilities to use a set of infection surveillance definitions that are specifically designed for long-term care facilities called the McGeer's Criteria. Reporting requirements. Influenza is a notifiable condition from the West Virginia Reportable Disease Rule. For laboratories, influenza is a Category 5 disease. Positive influenza laboratory reports by immune fluorescence, culture, or PCR are required to be reported within one week to the State Health Department. This is important for hospitals to know. If hospitals do confirmatory influenza testing, such as culture or PCR, they are required to be reporting weekly to the State Health Department in aggregate. For healthcare providers and facilities, influenza is a Category 4 disease. Healthcare providers and facilities are required to report influenza-related deaths in individuals less than 18 years of age within one week and these should be reported to your local health department. Influenza outbreaks are immediately reported to your local health department. Next, we will review the role of the local health department during flu season. Each local health department is required to recruit and maintain an influenza sentinel provider. An influenza sentinel provider is a healthcare provider that conducts surveillance for flu-like illness in collaboration through the State Health Department and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Each provider collects the total number of patients seen weekly and the number of patients seen weekly for influenza-like illness and they report this information online to a surveillance database called the ILINET. A sentinel provider can be a provider of any specialty, such as family physicians, pediatricians, or internists. They can be in any practice, which includes public health clinics, urgent care centers, emergency rooms, or student health centers. Data reported by Sentinel providers in combination with other flu surveillance data provides a national picture of influenza virus and influenza-like illness activity across West Virginia and the United States. It's a way we maintain situational awareness about flu, about flu across West Virginia and it helps us determine the start, the peak, and the end of flu season. It also indicates the severity of illness that individuals are seeing related to flu. This data can be helpful to guide prevention and control activities, vaccine strain selection, and patient care. Having a sentinel provider is a surveillance indicator used for the evaluation of local health departments and is a requirement of the Public Health Emergency Preparedness Grant. A sentinel provider that regularly reports is defined as a provider who reports to the ILI net greater than or equal to 17 of the 33 weeks from the beginning of October through the end of May. A second major responsibility of the local health departments during flu season is managing outbreaks. Outbreaks should be reported to the Division of Infectious Disease Epidemiology within one hour for notification of the outbreak. Respiratory outbreaks occur year-round. Health department staff should maintain a supply of flu kits, which can be used for respiratory testing to confirm the etiology of an outbreak. This supply needs to be maintained year-round and not just when you have an outbreak. 
It's good for local health departments to have five kits on hand at all times. Right now is the time for you to check your supply, not when you have an outbreak. Local health departments should assist with outbreak investigations, including collecting specimens, providing guidance on infection control, and tracking absentee rates for school outbreaks, as you are the boots on the ground. Local health departments should complete an outbreak report for each influenza outbreak and send it to the Division of Infectious Disease Epidemiology within 30 days of closing the outbreak. Local health departments or regional epidemiologists are encouraged to provide routine surveillance and feedback data to the stakeholders to help facilities improve on their management of outbreaks. Sentinel providers have three core functions. They are first to report surveillance data weekly into the ILI net. The online system should be accessed weekly to report the previous week's data by noon on Tuesday. Secondly, providers are to collect respiratory specimens weekly to be sent to the Office of Laboratory Services for testing. These are surveillance specimens, and they will be tested for influenza. Additionally, specimens that are negative for influenza will be tested on the BioFire film array for 20 different respiratory pathogens. The last function of Sentinel providers is to assist local health departments in specimen collection. There may be situations in which the local health department needs assistance collecting respiratory specimens to respond to a community-wide outbreak. Sentinel providers may serve as that local resource that could collect specimens on symptomatic residents within their community. Separate from Sentinel providers is Sentinel hospitals. These are hospitals with the laboratory capacity to test for influenza. Per the reportable disease rule, hospital laboratories are required to report positive lab results by PCR, immune fluorescence, or culture in weekly in aggregate form to the State Health Department via fax. Sentinel hospitals can also collect respiratory specimens that are tested at the state laboratory for surveillance. These specimens can be screened or not screened at the hospital. All specimens are, that are submitted are tested and subtyped for influenza. Negative specimens will be ran on the film array and tested for 20 different respiratory pathogens to increase the surveillance of respiratory diseases across West Virginia. Lastly, Sentinel hospitals are eligible to participate and report into the National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Surveillance System, more commonly known as NERVS. NERVS is a national laboratory-based system managed by CDC that monitors temporal and geographic patterns associated with RSV, <coughs> parainfluenza, respiratory adenoviruses, and human metanumoviruses, and rotavirus. West Virginia currently has six hospitals reporting into nerves. If you are interested in rolling into this national surveillance system, please contact me after the webinar via email. On slide 29, as I previously mentioned, under the reportable disease rule, hospitals report weekly in aggregate influenza totals to the state by type and subtype as available. Slide 29 shows a screenshot of the form for influenza laboratory reporting. This form can be faxed or emailed me to me directly. Results should be 
reported weekly for the previous week's data from Sunday to Saturday. The report form asks the number of positive influenza specimens by type and subtype as available, and additionally, how many specimens in total were tested. Hospitals that are currently enrolled into NERVs do not need to report this data, as we get the data reported electronically into NERVs. If you are interested in enrolling into NERVs, please contact me after the webinar. Respiratory specimens from patients who are recently symptomatic are needed for surveillance purposes. This allows the state to confirm current circulating strains, identify antigenic changes in the virus, and to test for resistance against antivirals for the clinical management of influenza. We need screened and unscreened specimens from hospital laboratories and providers to complete this. For surveillance purposes, the state is particularly interested in early and late season isolates since we have a lot of false positives associated with rapid flu tests. <coughs> and this also helps with the detection of novel flu viruses. We are also interested in specimens from hospitalized patients those who have a unique clinical presentation, and those who have reported travel internationally. Lastly, it's important to understand the role of the influenza coordinator here at the state. The influenza coordinator collects and reviews surveillance data. This data is posted weekly on our webpage to maintain situational awareness. Surveillance data is collected and reported weekly to CDC in order to provide a national picture of influenza. The influenza coordinator also leads investigations of pediatric deaths, antiviral resistance, and other epidemiological case findings. The influenza coordinator will send out communications throughout the season to keep stakeholders up to date with the most recent information surrounding influenza. Sentinel provider reporting records will also be sent out monthly during flu season, and requests regarding syndromic surveillance can be made. Lastly, the influenza coordinator responds to media requests during flu season. I'm available to provide talking points regarding the flu and flu activity across West Virginia. Lastly, the influenza coordinator is available if you need consultation regarding any influenza or respiratory outbreaks. I will now review the reporting into the ILI net. Sentinel providers should receive their work folders to access the ILI net by early October. Work folders contain welcome information for the beginning of the season along with instructions on reporting to the ILI net. The work folder will contain a provider ID and password. Providers need to access the ILI net by 12 p.m. each Tuesday to report the previous week's data. Providers need to log on to the ILI net by using their provider ID and password. The link to access the ILI net is www.n.cdc.gov backslash ILINet. Once you've logged into the ILINet system, providers will need to click to enter their weekly ILI report. The provider will record their information on the data input page. Providers will need to report the number of cases for influenza-like illness by age group and the total number of patients seen during the reporting period. 
It's important for providers to submit this data weekly to establish reliable trends so that we can identify increases in activity or distinguish patterns. Submitting respiratory specimens for surveillance purposes is highly encouraged. We request that both Sentinel providers and hospitals submit specimens to the Office of Laboratory Services weekly. Providers are encouraged to collect nasopharyngeal or MP swabs on patients with influenza-like illness or respiratory symptoms. In order to have a surveillance program that can determine the beginning of the flu season and to monitor the prevalence of spread of influenza throughout the year, we must receive both screened and unscreened specimens to the state lab. This means that if a patient has had a rapid flu test done or another test of influenza, the specimen is considered screened. All respiratory surveillance specimens will be tested for influenza. Additionally, any specimen that is negative for flu will be tested on the film array for, for 20 different respiratory pathogens. This is a free service to hospitals and sentinel providers. You may submit up to five specimens per week to the state laboratory. Flu kits. It's always recommended that each local health department and sentinel provider should have five flu kits on hand for respiratory testing and to respond to outbreaks. Included in your flu kit are packing instructions, collection instructions, viral transport media, which needs to be refrigerated, a return shipping container, label, and a cold pack. Respiratory virus specimen kits can be ordered by filling out the requisition form and by faxing it or by calling OLS at 304-558-3530. Next, I would like to provide you with some helpful suggestions regarding submitting surveillance specimens. Make sure you check expiration dates of your viral transport media as, the, as these have a short shelf life. It is your responsibility to keep a supply of these kits and to order new ones. Local health departments cannot order flu kits for their sentinel provider because return shipping labels are created based on the address on the request form. When it comes to mailing out specimens, make sure you have at least two patient identifiers on the specimen tube. Specimens must be kept refrigerated. If you cannot ship a specimen within 72 hours of collection, you may freeze a respiratory specimen until it can be shipped. Due to mailing constraints, please do not ship on Thursdays because the specimens will arrive on the weekend when the lab is closed. The lab can be open to run specimens for high priority outbreaks or novel strains, but this needs to be arranged by calling us here at the state. Sentinel providers and hospitals are allowed to batch ship specimens if this is more convenient. Next, we will review guidelines for influenza outbreaks in schools and healthy populations. The guidelines for investigating flu outbreaks in schools and healthy populations can be found on our website. Generally, we deal with school or child care facility outbreaks of flu. For healthy populations, the standard influenza-like illness case definition applies. This is a fever greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and a cough, and or sore throat. Using absentee rates, 
when flu is suspected at a flu is helpful because laboratory testing isn't always readily available at the school. A call down list is helpful early on in the investigation. A call down requires someone to call a sample of students out sick to collect information on symptoms and testing to estimate the proportion of absentees with flu-like symptoms. Antivirals are not recommended for healthy populations. However, those who may be immune compromised may be directed to their physician for post-exposure prophylaxis. This includes faculty or students who are pregnant. Persons who are ill with flu-like symptoms should be sent home. The ill person should stay home for 24 hours after their fever has ceased or without the use of antipyretics. Encouraging hand hygiene and cough etiquette is especially important in healthy settings to prevent transmission of flu. In general school outbreaks, we do not recommend closing unless there isn't sufficient staff to operate the school in a safe manner. It is scientifically proving that closing schools does not reduce disease transmission. School nurses should follow outbreaks in healthy populations until the absentee rate returns to normal, which is typically 10%. In smaller congregate settings like a child care facility, a line list might be more valuable to track your outbreak. An outbreak toolkit for healthy populations can be found on our website. Outbreaks in long-term care facilities are defined as three or more cases of influenza-like illness occurring within 72 hours or more of residence. It can also be a sudden increase in influenza-like illness or a single positive influenza test in conjunction with other compatible illnesses. Outbreaks in long-term care facilities are of significant public health interest because of the increase in morbidity and mortality associated with influenza in the elderly. Case ascertainment of the elderly residents with respiratory illnesses can be challenging. Using the McGeers criteria can be very helpful in determining whether you're dealing with an influenza lower respiratory or pneumonia outbreak. When defining cases of influenza-like illness in the elderly, it is more complex. An individual must have a fever greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and they also must have three subcriteria symptoms. The subcriteria symptoms include chills, new headache or eye pain, malaysia or body aches, malaise or loss of appetite, sore throat, or a new or increased dry cough. McGeer's case classification worksheet for respiratory illnesses in long-term care facilities can be found on our website under the local health department icon under the long-term care facility outbreak toolkit. Once an outbreak has been identified, prevention and control measures should be implemented immediately to prevent further transmission. Standard and drop-up precautions are recommended for all residents with suspected or confirmed influenza. For seven days after illness onset, or until 24 hours after the resolution of fever and respiratory symptoms, whichever is longer. All residents who are symptomatic should receive antiviral treatment. Treatment should not wait for laboratory confirmation. Antiviral prophylaxis is recommended for all non-ill residents 
regardless of vaccination status. This can be difficult to accomplish in large facilities because of the cost. In instances where symptomatic residents are isolated to a single wing or hall, it is acceptable to administer post-exposure prophylaxis to just the affected wing or hall as long as there is no further transmission outside of the hall or wing. This is why cohorting staff is so crucial to prevent further transmission in this type of setting. Additional information and recommendations on managing flu outbreaks in long-term care facilities can be found on our website in our toolkit for long-term care facilities. In recent years, various forms of mandatory enforcement policies have been implemented in healthcare settings to increase influenza immunization rates of healthcare workers. More than half of all U.S. hospitals have implemented requirements for influenza vaccination of hospital healthcare workers. Vaccination of healthcare workers is associated with reduced mortality in chronic care, long-term care homes, and reduced hospital-acquired infections in acute care. The literature supports that influenza vaccination can reduce absenteeism due to flu-like symptoms. Many hospitals have reported requiring face masks for healthcare workers who do not receive their annual flu vaccine. Low vaccination rates among healthcare workers could, that could get the flu and then pass it on to coworkers and patients. People with the flu are contain, contagious for up to one day before symptoms appear, and they can spread the virus without even realizing it. Patients in healthcare facilities are especially vulnerable to flu. Young children, pregnant women, and the elderly and those with chronic conditions are at greatest risk for flu-related hospitalizations and deaths. Routine annual influenza vaccination is recommended for all persons aged six months and older who do not have contradiction. Optimally, vaccination should occur before the onset of influenza activity in the community. Healthcare providers should offer vaccination as soon as the vaccine becomes available, but by the end of October. Vaccination should continue to be offered as long as influenza viruses are circulating within the community. Children aged six months through eight years of age who require two-dose vaccines should receive their first dose as soon as possible after the vaccine becomes available and the second dose four weeks or later. The two-dose recommendations for children six months of age to eight years of age is for children during their first season of vaccination only. While there are many different flu viruses, the seasonal flu vaccine is designed to protect against the top three or four flu viruses that research indicates will cause the most illness during the season. It takes about two weeks after vaccination for antibodies to develop in the body and to provide protection against the flu virus. Traditional flu vaccines made to protect against three different flu viruses are called trivalent vaccines. A quadrivalent vaccine is also available, which protect, protects against four different flu viruses. Three kinds of flu viruses commonly circulate among people today. That is the influenza A, H1N1 viruses, the influenza A, H3, N2 viruses, and influenza B viruses. Each year, one or two viruses 
of each kind are used to produce the seasonal flu vaccine. The quadrivalent vaccine that is available also protects them against an additional influenza B virus of the Yamagate lineage. Getting an annual flu vaccine is your first and best way to protect yourself and your family from the flu. Flu vaccine can reduce flu illnesses, doctor's visits, and missed time from work or school due to flu, as well as prevent flu-related hospitalizations. The more people who get vaccinated, the more people they will be able to protect from flu, including older people, very young children, pregnant women, and people with certain health conditions who are more vulnerable to serious flu complications. This season, only injectable flu vaccines or flu shots should be used. The live attenuated influenza vaccine or the nasal spray vaccine is not recommended for use during the 2016-2017 flu season because of concerns over its effectiveness. The vaccine composition this year has been updated from last season to better match the predicted circulating viruses. The recommendations for people with egg allergies have also been updated for this season. People who have experienced only hives after exposure to an egg can get any licensed flu vaccine that is otherwise appropriate for their age and health. Secondly, people who have symptoms other than hives after exposure to eggs or who have needed epinephrine or another emergency medical intervention can also be life, can also get a flu shot in a medical setting supervised by a healthcare provider who is able to recognize and manage severe allergic conditions. Settings include hospitals, clinics, health departments, and physician offices. Lastly, people with egg allergies no longer have to wait 30 minutes after receiving their vaccine. For more information, please visit our website, www.dhhr.org wv.gov backslash oeps backslash disease backslash flu. That concludes the end of the influenza webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you so much for viewing. If you wish to receive nursing CMEs, please email me to receive your post-test. Thank you.